Excellent. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to the Grit City Think and Drink. Glad you all came tonight. Um, it's always nice when the rain comes because then everybody actually wants to stare at the computer instead of going outside. So appreciate seeing everybody. Uh, if you get a chance, put your image up on there, at least for now, so we can actually say hi to everybody who's in the room. Almost feel like we're together. That would be awesome. Hello, everybody. So many regulars that I recognize from the Swiss. Everybody, hello. Uh, welcome to the show. So, uh, live from uh, Tacoma, uh, we bring you the Grit City Think and Drink. Uh, welcome. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to the sponsors of the Grit City Think and Drink. Uh, my employer, the University of Washington Tacoma School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, uh, and uh, the Swiss. So, we can't do this, the Swiss. I am not actually at the Swiss right now. We have our virtual background. So if you also want to feel like you are partying with the rest of us, uh, Mark put the link up so you can get your virtual Swiss background and come join us at the Swiss uh, virtually until we can be there in person. And I will personally buy a drink for anybody who remembers this when we show up in person again, uh, uh, whenever that happens. So just remind me and that will happen for sure. Um, so uh, for those of you, how many people are new to the Grit City Think and Drink? Let me know. Anybody not being here before? Maybe. Nobody's fessing up at this point. I should have got a beer, but I'm drinking <laughs> seltzer. There's a couple people actually here who, uh, who have raised their hands. So I welcome. can make a gin and tonic, though, when I'm done with this. By the way, you're now unmuted in case people don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help more. I, I don't know what's good best. Introduce uh, uh, and give them, uh, they will give us an amazing talk, um, which will floor all of you. Uh, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so in the chat box, you can actually enter your questions. Uh, I will take them in order afterwards and make sure that I pass those on to folks so it doesn't get too crazy afterwards. And then if we get a chance at the end, um, we'll actually open up the mic so um, we've made sure that we haven't been Zoom bombed and you all can actually say hi to each other if you wish. Um, so we'll try to do that at the end. Uh, the, we do this every second Tuesday of the month. So June 9th is our next one. And our speaker, Cynthia Housen, is actually in the house. Hello, Cynthia. And her husband, Pierre, they're going to actually talk about the Chinese wine industry. So if you didn't know about that, um, you can learn all about it uh, in our June talk. Um, that's a replay of a talk that was supposed to happen during the start of the whole COVID madness. And so I'm glad that Cynthia and Pierre were able to move their talk and we can all hear about it. So definitely join us in June. Happy to see you all, guys. Uh, also, if you didn't know, um, this is to uh, also to pay homage to our local businesses, and the Swiss has been a sponsor of this event for a really long time, uh, and they um, put up money, um, put up a gift certificate every time for us to come and, and do our event there. So if you haven't had a chance to actually get some food from the Swiss for this talk, if you get a chance, order some food from them uh, and, and at some other time. Um, but if you're uh, one of those lucky people who actually um, went and got your food today, we have giveaways that we normally give out during the talk are giving, given away with the food from the Swiss. So anybody in the room win socks or a gift certificate? Let's see. Anybody, anybody? I don't see anybody fessing up, so I don't know. It's possible that they went without. So if you guys get a chance, get over there and maybe you'll win some socks. They're really stylish. I don't have a pair on. I have my Think and Drink shirt. I have my Think and Drink hat. And we are now on to socks. So eventually we're going to clothe ourselves in entirely in Think and Drink swag. So hopefully you'll join me with um, getting that stuff together. Uh, without uh, further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers so that they can get started. So Dr. Anaid Yarena is an assistant professor in the School of Urban Studies at the University of Washington Tacoma. She's an architect, planner, and researcher who investigates public participation processes and activities related to housing and community development in the U.S. and Latin America. Welcome, Anaid. 
Uh, Dr. Ruben Casas is uh, an assistant professor in the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences. He does research on and teaches courses relating to cities, public life, and community and civic engagement. So welcome, Ruben. And special guest all the way from South America, Dr. Flavia de Avia is an assistant professor in international relations department at the Federal University of Sergipe, or is it Sergipe? I'll have to get that from you later in Brazil. Uh, she's a visiting scholar at UW Tacoma. Her areas of expertise include human rights, humanitarian law, international public and labor, and biopolitics. So welcome to Flavia. All right, without further ado, I give you the speakers for tonight. It's all yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to get out of the way and then start our presentation. Uh, as you see the, the title of our present, oh, I need to share it first. <laughs> yeah, that, um, that's why I always have my cheat screen down here when I'm teaching, too. Okay. Share. Ooh, right. You know what I didn't do, Mark? I didn't check the make sure that the sound and video were shared. Okay. So that should do it now. All right. Looks good on my screen. And so the title of our presentation is The Social Value of Property in the Quest for Affordable Housing. And thank you for joining us today for our presentation. We hope its content continues to foster and support much needed public debate and action on alternative ways of coexisting and supporting one another. We seek to join our voices in solidarity with the many, many members of our society for whom the status quo is oppressive and harmful. The status quo, an often unchecked capitalist system has under the guise of social policies diminish the viability and sustainability of our society, in particular, our ability to shelter the population. The U.S. has made one policy decision after another that has set its prospects of addressing the housing crisis further back. These decisions range from systematically reducing its public housing stock to overly relying on private investors for the production of any affordable housing, and maintaining an almost flat and minuscule budget allocation for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in relation to the total federal budget for over 40 years. On top of these woefully insufficient policy approaches, there are widespread norms and behaviors that present additional barriers to the creation of more, much needed affordable housing. These include rampant racism, elitism, and individualism, arguably pillars of the U.S.'s current economic and legal systems. These political and cultural trends, coupled with increased housing costs that do not keep up pace with wages, growing income inequality, and insufficient housing production, particularly that attainable to middle and low income residents, have exacerbated households' ability to find and or remain sheltered. The hope we bring today is in proposing that we reevaluate our legal framework and the function we ascribe to property in our society. Property can have a true social function by being used as shelter for the many in need. What we are proposing is that we routinely stop and ask ourselves, when a property sits derelict and vacant, what role is it serving? When a parcel of land remains vacant and undeveloped, whose needs is it meeting? Now, to go into presenting the seed of this alternative we bring to you today. The way the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution is currently interpreted prevents the government from creating the type of public housing policies we need to fully address the widespread housing affordability crisis we're experiencing. A part of this amendment, the Takings Clause, which limits the power of eminent domain, applies a restrictive definition of public use. This definition of public use 
disregards the social function of property as a rationale for the repurposing of property. So how does the takings clause currently work? The takings clause states that private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation. While the Fifth Amendment only applies to actions by the federal government, it is the Fourteenth Amendment that extends the takings clause to actions by state and local governments. Thus, when the government wishes to acquire property, for example, to build a new local police station, it first attempts to buy the property on the open market. However, if the owner refuses to sell, the government can go to court and exercise the power of eminent domain by having the court condemn the property in favor of the government. The takings clause imposes two requirements on government in order to exercise this power. First, the property to be acquired must be for public use. And second, the government must pay just compensation to the owner for the property that is taken. The Supreme Court has long construed the term public use to include not only cases in which the public can arguably use the property, for example, as a public road, but also in cases in which the property is not literally used by the public, but by the use of property, but the use of the property will serve a public purpose. So how can decision makers argue that providing shelter is serving a public purpose? Through the concept of the social function of property, the purpose of this talk is to examine the notion of the social function of property as a way to reinterpret how the concept of public use is applied to allow eminent domain. In particular, we examine how the social function of property would expand the sources of affordable housing opportunities if the definition of public use were expanded. To give you a preview, I can share with you that there are grassroots efforts already happening around the country. I will describe one of these examples later in this presentation. But first, let's understand more about the context and definition of the legal principle of the social function of property. And for that, I welcome Dr. Flavia de Avila. Property is not an absolute and individual private right. It can be understood as having a social function. The legal definition of property follows an ideological concept. One of the most common ways to define property is a class of things that are capable of being owned. And one of the most important property rights is ownership. Centered on this initial premise, property based on individual and private ownership of goods is conceived in many juridical systems as a universal concept. The prevalence of property as absolute, exclusive, and unbound right is the result of the development of philosophical theories and of the capitalist regime originated in Europe. This idea was reflected in legal rules and was imposed through colonization across large parts of the world. On the contrary, social function of property was developed as an opposition theory to the main legal doctrines of the 19th century, advocating that the state is responsible for blocking actions that could justify the collective and communitary use of the property. In social function of property theory, the ownership idea was rethought in a way to demand a strong coercive role of the state. In its implementation, forms of surveillance and penalties can be applied if social duties connected to the property function have been breached. As a result, Legal actions with extensive consequences that can lead to the loss of property by expropriations, for example, can be applied. Addressed to urban, urban property, social function in the first place defines a set of general guidelines that demarcates how property is interpreted from the legal point of view. This notion comes from the separation of property rights from Use right. Therefore, 
Several articles of the 1988 Brazilian Federal Constitution apply the social function of property as a broader legal principle concerning property and in specific sectors of Brazilian economic and social order. In short, the Brazilian Constitution recognized that urban property has, or ought to have, an eminently social function, and its value is the result of collective undertakings. Articles 182 and 183 dedicated to urban development policy had had significant influence on the urban land planning and squatters' rights in the municipal level. Based on the constitution provisions of Article 182, municipal governments can determine the use of urban land through progressive taxation, forced subdivision, or expropriation to accomplish the social function. Nevertheless, to enforce social function of property in cities of more than 20,000 inhabitants, a master plan must be adopted by the municipality authorities. In 2001, the city statute was in force as a complementary legislation to the constitutional provisions as the core of a democratic approach to urban planning in Brazil, responsible to address the right to the city into Brazilian legislation. Article 39 of the statute stipulates that urban property fulfills its social function when it meets the basic requirements for ordering the city set forth in the master plan, assuring that the needs of the citizens are satisfied with regards to quality of life, social justice, and the development of economic activities. The idea that property carries social value and performs a social function is not as foreign to U.S. audiences as we might initially assume. Historically and presently, property has played a crucial role in the formation and shaping of an American nation and society. We see it in our guiding mythologies and in our economic policies. Take Manifest Destiny, a concept and later a doctrine that was originally promulgated by John Sullivan, a 19th century newspaper editor and columnist. While many of us might be familiar with Sullivan's sense as a largely ideological and symbolic idea that the nascent American nation had a divine mandate to spread across the land, here I want to point out how this doctrine also works materially and how it premised the idea that the taking and remaking of land into property is essential to the idea of the US in general. This image, which some of you may be familiar with, American Progress by John Gast, has become closely associated with the doctrine of manifest destiny as it depicts some of the very arguments Sullivan, Sullivan made in his writing. Per Sullivan, the young nation was compelled by divine prov providence to expand into the West. And because many of the lands in that direction were already populated by native tribes and in some cases by other colonial powers, Sullivan had to make a case for why U.S. settlers had a greater claim to that land than those who were already there. This picture, this image, American Progress, depicts this case through powerful imagery and through aesthetic choice. In the center of the image, we see an angelic figure. This is American Progress. She is cast in light. She is glowing. Where she has already been is also cast in light, and where she is going, there is darkness, and presumably her expansion into that part of the image will bring light too. This divine figure hovers above the land and brings new light to those places that she ex is expanding into. Behind her, land has already been tamed. The soil is being tilled, the land is being made productive. In front of her, where the clouds gather and there is darkness, there are wild animals, 
The native people seem to be running away from American progress. The land remains untamed. It is not yet of value. Not for long though, American progress as she is making her way out west brings with her learning as is represented by the book under her arm and technology as is represented by the cable in her hand. And then there are the enterprising and conquering pioneers at her feet, which are spectating and they are working the land. They are bringing value to it. Certainly, there's more to say about this image, but this brief discussion should help us see how Manifest Destiny is rooted in the idea that land has value when it is permitted to be dominated, worked, when it is turned into property. Soon after, Sullivan's writing, his ideas would become doctrine, and the doctrine would engender policies, and those policies would rationalize wars. Some of those policies, their influence remains today. Take, for example, the Homestead Act. Many of us know about this policy and how it allocated land to those who would venture out west. What is less discussed is the requirement that the land that was taken from some and given to others carried the condition that the land be improved, that it be transformed into property. Because it is through this transformation that other projects, symbolic and material, could be carried out. The Homestead Act is one of the first examples of how the social value of property is premised on the ownership of land. Here we see domesticity and family life so intimately connected to the idea of land and property. And we certainly recognize these values as being with us today in American society. These values have come to be linked with ownership and property well into the 20th and 21st century. And in some ways, it is what premises one of our founding mythologies, that of the American dream. It has been made across the literature spanning a variety of disciplines. Gwendolyn Wright, an architectural historian in her book, Building the Dream, makes a particularly interesting case about the ways U.S. housing policy has long been an instrument through which aspects of U.S. society has been remade, transformed, revised, all in ways that align with larger political and social agendas. We might, for example, think about the ways white flight in the middle part of the 20th century was aided by policies such as the Federal Housing Act, which was meant to make home affordability and the acquisition of mortgages much easier for people. It also had the perhaps not unintended consequence of driving middle-class white Americans to the outskirts of cities and to the creation of suburbs because this particular property also allowed municipalities to extend essential infrastructure out from the inner parts of cities to what we now recognize as suburbs. Over time, this facilitation of suburbanization has created ideas and fostered perceptions about those that live in cities and those that live in suburbs, so that when we hear words like inner city, or when we think about good schools versus not so good schools, or when we think about the concept of affordable housing, we tend to think about people and about who they are and are not in terms having to do with race, social class, gender, and national origin. According to Gwendolyn Wright, the way that housing policy in the US has been allowed to develop is one way to understand the American dream. For Wright, how housing has been allowed to develop in the US cannot be unlinked from our ideas about citizenship belonging, and social economic class status. Because the American dream is so premised on the assumption that home ownership is within reach for everyone in US society, it's worth asking what exactly about owning a home is so essential to American identity and to one's ability to be seen as American. 
Bright's survey of the development of American housing shows us how housing in the U.S. has really been one grand experiment in social engineering. Through policies, economic and political, the federal government, and to some extent, regional and local civic authorities have variously sought to shape a nation. And this shaping has often intersected with race, class, and gender. The concept of affordable housing is perhaps one of the most salient examples of this, but we might also think about more recent debates about zoning, densification, whether or not cities should allow residents to build auxiliary dwelling units on their property, uh, and also about who has access to the city via mobility, mo via modes of mobility and transit. These are just a few examples of how, where one lives, and what neighborhoods one is allowed to live in, and what, what one can afford is linked to ideas about our society. One fairly recent example of how property plays a social function in American society is the Opportunity Zones program that was ushered in by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. According to the IRS, the program is designed to, quote, spur economic development and job creation in distressed communities by providing tax benefits to investors who invest in eligible capital into these communities, end quote. Put this way, it seems like a sound idea, except that that's not how the Opportunity Zones program has worked out in actuality. In fact, three years into the program, there's wide agreement by policymakers, journalists, and other analysts that the program is of primary value to the investors themselves and not so much to the residents of these so-called distressed communities. Numerous journalistic outlets have looked into the program and have concluded, as Forbes, as Forbes magazine did in a story published about a year ago, that, quote, there remains a question as to whether or not this program will ultimately serve to add value or extract value from these communities, end quote. To date, wealthy investors seem to be the ones that are benefiting the most as they are able to shelter their capital gains tax from federal taxes for up to 10 years. But it is still unclear whether the residents of the communities that these projects are actually meant to benefit will. Tacoma is not exempt from this new way of leveraging the social value of property. In fact, much of the city has been designated a quote unquote distressed community per the program's definition. And therefore many properties in the city of Tacoma qualify. One property in this area, the Washington Tower in downtown Tacoma has been recently targeted as a piece of property that will be redeveloped by the investments of wealthy investors. Given the increasing inaccessibility to attainable housing in our region and in our city, it follows that any new housing development or redevelopment should take into account the various obstacles that residents in the city and the region face in trying to get suitable quality and affordable housing. The Opportunity Zone program makes no room for such determinations a priori and investors and developers need not address the local conditions in deciding to develop or redevelop a property under the Opportunity Zones program. To date, the company overseeing the redevelopment of the Washington Tower has not said how much units in the building will was completed. At this juncture, the redevelopment of the Washington Tower here in Tacoma seems poised to benefit wealthy investors, but it is not yet clear whether or if or how it might benefit residents of Tacoma who need more attainable housing. The social function of property, as it is demonstrated in the Opportunity Zone program, recalls comments made by former New York City Mayor Bloomberg during a recent Democratic presidential debate. In a response to a question about how his tenure as mayor had facilitated further redlining in the city, the mayor pointed to a program his foundation has initiated, which has brought bank branches into low-income neighborhoods. He said, quote, 
Because if you don't have a branch bank there, you can't get a checking account. You can't get a checking account, you can't get a loan. You can't get a loan, you can't get a mortgage. Then you don't have any wealth. The way Bloomberg talks about the program here creates a direct line between the ability to finance the acquisition of property, in other words, to attain a mortgage, and the accumulation of wealth. His comments belie a stark contrast between how many of us see the purchase of a home and how the wealthy see the purchase of property. Whereas for most middle class and working class Americans, purchasing a home reflects and represents one's ability to provide home and shelter. That is, it's value lies primarily in practical considerations. For the wealthy, it is presumably an act which furthers wealth. This is not to say that owning a home does not also present non-wealthy Americans with the opportunity to increase their bank accounts. It can and often does. Rather, what I'm pointing out here is the difference between how middle class and working class people value property versus how it is valued by the wealthy. We all understand that property carries value and that it's not just material or monetary value, but that it also carries social value. In our society, the role of the social function of property has been rather circumscribed. It has facilitated nation making and it has allowed the wealthy to further accumulate and concentrate their wealth. But can it do more? Now I come back to tell you about that example that happened over the past year in the United States as part of a coordinated grassroots effort that appeared in response to the housing emergency. It happened in Oakland, California a city twice the size of Tacoma that is historically progressive and, like Tacoma, home to a richly multicultural working class. This effort inspired change, specifically in promoting community control of land, redefining of private property through cooperatives and land trusts, and by lending another voice that joined the call for the right to housing as a constitutional right. In the second half of 2019, a group composed of African-American women who call themselves Moms for Housing announced their occupation of a long empty home on Magnolia Street. The home was owned by a corporate speculator. As they occupied the home, they declared that housing is a human, human right and that they were using that right. They transformed the neglected Magnolia property into a home nicknamed Mom's House. Then, they went a step further. They ignited a blaze of activism that promised to alter power relations in Oakland's real estate market. The developer tried to evict the moms in early December, but their attorney obtained a stay. In the meantime, the Oakland Community Land Trust, which like other land trusts and cooperatives around the country, aims to take properties off the speculative market and make them permanently affordable, offered to buy the house and either sell it or rent it back to the moms. The developer refused the offer. The following month, in January, a judge ordered the moms and their children to quit the property within five days. Moms remained in the home. Around 5 a.m. on January 14th, under orders from the Alameda County Sheriff, armed police used a battering ram to knock down the front door of the house. Everyone inside was arrested. Alameda County has declined to pursue criminal charges against the moms and their allies, but the sheriff's office has refused to apologize for its show of force. As Oaklanders process the shock of the eviction, calls for accountability spread. California Governor Newsom pressured the developer to make a deal, and on Mar Martin Luther King Jr. Day, all parties announced that the company had agreed to negotiate with the Oakland Community Land Trust. The land trust used a mix of public and private funds to purchase the property, then leased it back to one of, or more of the moms with the promise of keeping it affordable in perpetuity. As Dr. Casas referenced in the example of the redevelopment of the Washington Tower, these questions hit close to home. 
Before us, we have an opportunity to consider how property has been valued and made to function in our city and region, and for whom it is made to work. The COVID-19 moment has magnified the structural problems within our society and all kinds of violence suffered by people through the stay at home order because they don't have a home to stay in and or their current housing arrangement is untenable. And this is even, no, even more evident now. This is a moment to reflect and rethink our society's paradigm. This pandemic presents a new context in which actions will take place. Undeniably, this new reality has allowed us to demonstrate to ourselves that there are alternate ways of coexisting and supporting one another. Incorporating the social function of property in our decision making is one way in which we can do just that. Thank you for your time. Nicely done. Thank you very much to all three of our speakers. So if you haven't uh, used Zoom much before, if you're one of those lucky people, um, you can go down towards the bottom of your screen um, and there's a little thing that says chat. If you click on that, um, you'll be a little chat box and you can actually enter your questions there and I will read them to our speakers and you get an extra kudos if you can stump our speakers. That's always the running thing. So um, <clears throat> if you can ask them such a hard question, I'm looking at Linda and Mark and James and some other folks on there. If you can stump them, um, you get um, all kinds of kudos from me and maybe a pair of Think and Drink socks. So enter your questions or, yep, we'll give you a second to do that. While we're waiting for questions, just want to um, make sure that you guys all again remember that June 9th is our next talk. So hopefully you'll join us for that. And if you want to win some of the awesome swag or gift certificate from the Swiss and support one of the local businesses, make sure you place an order for the day of and you can pick up. They have a great pickup. You just drive up in your car, call the number, they come out, drop it off. Uh, so it's nice and safe for everybody. So definitely give out to our businesses. So we have a question from Leanne. Uh, do you have any local examples that are similar to Oakland's mom's movement? So any of the speakers want to take that one? I do not know of any local examples of occupations. Uh, I do know of a couple of examples. I wouldn't say necessarily local to Tacoma, but within just a, a few miles around Tacoma of community land trusts. So what would that be? Um, there's one, I, I don't, I think one of them is called Rosewood. It's in um, oh, wow. Staten Island. There is a community land trust uh, that operates there. And I feel like there's, I don't remember the, the name of that one, but it's towards Lakewood. There's another one, a fairly recent one. I might also add that for Tara, um, the group that works uh, on land trust issues with rural communities in Washington, I think has recently started working with the Hilltop community about redeveloping the CVS there that's been uh, sort of sitting there vacant and derelict for some years now. Um, so the last I heard is that there have been some productive conversations with uh, community leaders um, on in Hilltop to see if Forterra can help um, sort of re, redevelop that property um, with the community's input sort of at the forefront. Thank you very much. We have another question from uh, Sarah. Let's see if I can get back to it. What, if anything, has Tacoma been doing about the homeless population since the stay at home order? Uh, just one clarification, it's a Rite Aid site, not a CVS site um, in Hilltop. Oh, I'm so bad about brands. <laughs> that's, sorry, that's a, I, I don't even know if we have CVS on this, around here, but yeah, lots of Rite Aids. Mm, I actually do not know 
Um, I have not kept up to date on what policies the city has implemented, and I'm not currently working with any um, of the city's um, departments that work on um, providing support in that end. So I don't know if Ruben or Flavia are aware of anything. Yeah, I have not seen anything proactive at least come across my desktop or email regarding that or many other issues actually that a lot of, a lot of other cities are sort of taking up and, and, and reconsidering in the wake of stay at home orders and um, the pandemic. Um, I suppose that's a topic for a larger conversation, but Tacoma has been kind of quiet on the forefront of some of these issues. Um, but, you know, we can get into that a little, a little more a little later. I, I do think I saw something about them. They were actually housing some of the homeless population in unused hotel rooms, at least for part of the, to try to thin out and give distance in some of the shelters. But that's the only thing I've actually seen at all. Uh, another question from you from Ricky. Do you see ways in which your research relates to housing situations brought on by the pandemic? Well, I think Anait's point at the end is probably where we are now in terms of our thinking. Um, unfortunately, it seems that the pandemic has brought on um, some, some sort of widespread awareness that the way that we have been doing things uh, at a number of levels um, and in a number of areas is inadequate and was sort of already poised to crack or break under any little strain. And here we are. Um, so I think housing is one amongst many uh, ways that we do things in American society that uh, now we have an opportunity to rethink and, and remake. Um, housing, I think, for a long time has presented cities and regions across the U.S. with a, a really thorny problem and a really thorny issue. Um, and now in the advent of the pandemic, I think that we can't ignore it anymore. And we really start, we really need to start thinking about what property does and can do in cities and regions um, more than just help people accumulate wealth. Because if we continue down that path, um, I'm not sure that we won't be in a situation again where people are fearful of losing their homes um, or being kicked out of an apartment because they can't make rent because um, they think it's unsafe to go to work or because you know their employer has cut hours or cut jobs. By the way, there's a response from Alice who's on here who says uh, she would suggest that people check out the Facebook page for Tacoma Pierce County Coalition to End Homelessness. And she mentions that there's a Friday morning Zoom meetings uh, with that group and she gives a link down below. So if anybody's interested in getting connected to that, um, looks like we have somebody who knows what's going on. So um, thank you, Alice. Uh, let's see, another question from Cynthia. What would be the first step you could recommend of what we as individuals can do to promote community land trusts or other affordable housing here in Tacoma? I mean, I think the very, very first step would be to what we're doing right now. So participate in public conversations around it, understand the issue, read up a little bit on the history of um, community land trust broadly in the United States. It's not a new concept. It's just not something that I would call widespread and widely uh, kind of seen as um, an approach to housing. And so that that's like the very first step that I can think of. Um, I don't know if Ruben and or Flavia have another, like what, what, what to do to move in that direction. Something I do in my classes is I bring it up with the students, also current and future decision makers. It's like bringing, up, bringing it up as a potential source of um, support, relief, and a direction forward. Um, I also know of particular groups in the community that are thinking about and looking to organize. And so when and if you come across those, um, those groups to 
lend support either through, I mean, like support looks in many, it looks at many different ways. It could be support by doing, conducting some research, uh, being willing to present or uh, speak at a public hearing. I mean, like there's a long list of ways in which we can support, but um, it does require having community connections and being available to uh, groups that are organizing to do, um, to start a community land trust. Uh, I'll also add that for those of us that are in a position where we can buy a home, you know, in the city or, or in the region, um, we could also start by simply thinking about what, what function our own home, our own property is playing in the community that we live in. Uh, Tacoma recently has, has made some strides in allowing people, for example, to build auxiliary dwelling units on their property. And sometimes it's just a matter of thinking, you know, and I hate to prescribe how people should or should not use their property, but the idea, you know, of a house with a big yard and a big lawn seems rather, again, maybe to, to borrow some of Gwendolyn Wright's language, rather unique to American society. But we might think about how else we can leverage the property that we have been fortunate enough to be able to afford in ways that serves a larger social function. And I don't know, maybe that is as much as seeing about building an ADU on our property, or it could also mean putting some, you know, plants into the ground, growing them and putting a table up on the sidewalk for people to come and get, you know, our harvest of tomatoes or peppers or whatever it may be. Because I think right now we tend to limit ourselves to the idea of what a home or what property can be. Um, but if Cynthia, as she's asking, if we're asking what can we do as individuals, well, all we really have to do is start thinking about how the house that we live in, whether we are paying it off to the bank or whether we own it already or whether we are renting, can play a larger role um, in the community than we have been led to believe uh, by some some larger discourses uh, that inform um, our idea of what the American dream is. Thank you. Well, and, and I, the juridical point of view, normally when you have a lawyer involved in the situation because you have a conflict and this is not good <laughs> in the sense that you're gonna need a lawyer to do that, but um, when you ha when you act strategically in the lawsuit, for example, and you address a lawsuit, and it's here in the United States, you can propose a case that eventually is going to end at in the Supreme Court. And this is would be a way to challenge uh, the the fourth. 14th Amendment and other interpretations of the Constitution here in the United States. This is would be, a, for example, the Oklahoma case would be a case. Well, they had a settlement before, but would be a, a case to reveal and to think and, and, and to affect the juridical system. And because you affect this juris, juridical system, you can spread uh, this through um the economic and and social warrior order as well it's an idea it happened in brazil because of the, our constitution but at the same time we have structural violence in this within society so we can we can address this but at the same time we didn't correct the problem so i think what ruben is proposing is deeper and then you're going to start with the roots of the problem and not in the in a different field that would not be within the society. Thank you, Flavia. Uh, we have one more question here uh, from Jay Platts. Uh, without a shortage of available properties, uh, would first-time homeowner incentive programs like down payment programs or subsidized loans be more effective than eminent domain and redistribution? Uh, 
maybe that's our stump question, right? Because uh, <laughs> it depends on effective at what. So if we go back to the question of are we trying to in um, kind of it's uh, it's kind of like allow someone to um, accumulate wealth. Um, I think yes, that's what that uh, or try to or begin to accumulate wealth or get into the housing market and the the very consumerist market that that is, uh, because the housing market. I think one of the reasons why we are where we are at is because the like it's it's an economic driver. Um, it is this consumption machine that uh, in many in many ways in many different ways is demonstrated as for example despite the fact that household size has continuously de decreased over the past I think 40 45 years the the average the median the average house size has increased and so it's this notion of like there's there's no end to our consumption of larger homes and any new any new construction nowadays has three to four bedrooms and three to four bathrooms despite the fact that likely not not exclusively but likely we're going to have a smaller household moving into them so um yes uh there there is again if the if the purpose is to allow people to join this um, merry-go-round um there those are effective if what we're trying to do is in, is is to get off the merry-go-round and start to maybe slow it down a little bit the the way i see it is removing housing from the speculative market is a way to do just that where housing doesn't become just a commodity that is traded for the highest to the highest bidder and then what ends up happening is that that leaves behind a lot of members of society that are either not like not in a position to be the highest bidders and so then they are, end up without shelter so it's not like a, just like oh well you didn't win you know at the poker hand and then whatever it's like no like they end up in a very dire circumstance so i guess it depends on what we're trying to achieve <laughs> let me ask uh, i don't see any other questions i had sort of a follow-up i guess is when uw tacoma was created um the immediate uh thing that happened right afterwards is so many people tried to grab land to keep it from basically to hold on to it and to speculate on land because they knew the university would actually drive housing prices up around this. This has been a lot of the sort of dis discussion around building of things like universities and places um, like we did. And I guess one of the ideas would be what can the university do or what could the, I mean, I hate to think of it about what we should have done, but what could the university do to actually potentially make room for affordable housing, especially since students, uh, our students need so much of it? Yeah, this is actually a really good question. There's really good research on how universities have been some of the most fierce drivers of, to use the word du jour gentrification in cities where they are that where they're built up and there are some really really infamous players uh, on that list i don't know if uw tacoma is one of those infamous players i think if you look at um the overall effect it's it's a bit mixed but there are other universities across the u.s that um we might see their role within their cities despite how they describe themselves more as urban developers than as uh, educational institutions in the city. But your question though, I think, um, I think it's a difficult one to answer. At the same time, I think that we have seen some efforts towards having universities play a more fair role in how property values go up or down in relation to where they are. I mean, in, you know, UW Tacoma, for example, is, giving a lot of people a break right now on the properties that they do rent to businesses in Tacoma. Um, I also think that there's more to do in terms of building housing that is available to students, but perhaps is also available to non-students that uh, to some degree 
is subsidized by the university or by um, private, private public partnerships that tend to often favor the developer, not the residents of communities. I think there's another way to leverage those relationships because um, we can't do away with those private public partnerships. I mean, academic institutions are finding that that's one of the lifelines that they have um, for, for staying afloat. But I think that there's a way of leveraging those relationships so that they don't purely or, or solely benefit the developer, so that they're also sort of benefiting residents of the community. There's a lot of things that, that, that I think universities can do to both mitigate um, some of what you're describing um, and also be a better community player in, re in relation to housing and other forms of public infrastructure. I'm just not so sure that a lot of universities are interested in doing that because if you can develop the area around you and if you own a lot of that property, that's quite a bit of money that's coming your way that you, you sort of get to keep because as a public institution, you're sort of, you're, you're not as impacted by finance regulation as, as let's say a business that is not an academic institution is. So, um, but I think UW Tacoma, you know, has done a little bit of both. Um, but as we expand up the hill, I think we need to be having these conversations because um, the nature of the city is going to change in relation to how we develop. Thank you. There is one last question before we end for tonight. Uh, James asks, is there anything we can learn from Brazil's landless movement uh, to better position us to advocate for affordable housing for low income families and the homeless in urban and or rural areas? Flavia? Um, yes, it's um, nowadays, of course, we having problems with authoritarianism in Brazil, but um, would say that the ruthless movement and the landless movement, they played a very, very important role um, because uh, they, they organized the society. So uh, in the preparation of the constitution, uh, some of these movements, especially the landless movement, um, was really important to, uh, to address those articles. And even the, the concept of social functional property, that is not new in our, in our juridical system, but it was enforced by the 1988 constitution. So they acted um, strategically and um, they were really well organized what they are doing. But there are gonna be a lot of people in Brazil that consider them squatters, for example. And, and also criminals. So, um, and I understand why I already said, uh, and, and you already point out here that uh, this, I have to have land to be wealthy or to, um, um, to, to have social status. And I do not care people do not have land. For example, if I'm a farmer, for example, there are uh, farmers that doesn't have, uh, don't, don't have this specifically this mindset, but it's common. So um, I think what is important to learn is not from this movement and from the Brazilian experience, it's not criminalize this movement. Not, in, not understand as they're going to be against the society. No, they're addressing a different point of view of property. And to not think that individual property is an absolute right. To think differently. Uh, so I think if you have the opportunity to do something here based on the Brazilian um, example, and do something differently, what we've done is not considered, it's not, they're not criminals. They're just fighting for a right that was denied for, you know, centuries. 
Thank you. Um, I think uh, we are done at this point so that people can uh, get on to other things this evening. I just posted, because uh, somebody asked, um, Alice asked, um, if you want to share this with other folks or check out, you missed some of the content because you got here a little bit later. Um, all of these talks that we're doing now are actually will be available online. So the last Think and Drink and this one will both be, it usually takes about a week or so for the um, Mark the Magician to actually turn this into a YouTube link so you guys can check it out afterwards. So um, feel free to share that with others um, and to check out some of the past talks we've had that you may have missed um, since this whole pandemic thing started. So um, thank you all for being here. Um, if anybody wants a chance to actually chat in person, we will open up the um, your mics so that you can actually chat with each other briefly afterwards. Um, but otherwise, thank you all very much for being a, ho a virtual host at this point. And definitely, I forgot to thank uh, Mark and the multimedia uh, group that's at UW Tacoma who's given of their time to make this stuff happen during this event and work in their magic. So thank you to Mark and, and to their crew um, for this. So thank you all very much. I uh, hope to see you in June. Uh, otherwise, have an excellent uh, month. And hopefully we'll be able to socially distance with up to four other people by the time we see each other again. Bye. <laughs>